Hey friends, Damian Mason coming at you with some thoughts, consideration, and outlook for those of us in the world's most important industry, that is the business of agriculture. I'd like you to share this with your friends in ag, but also your friends that are not in ag so they can understand what we are looking at under a Biden-Harris administration. Officially, it's not been called, but the media has been saying that it's going to be a Biden presidency. So assuming that holds, here's what I'm going to say is happening and we can anticipate and maybe we need to work around or they're going to impact us in three specific categories. Policy issues on trade, renewable energy, and immigrant labor. First off, trade. We have always viewed trade in U.S. ag and in North American ag as a silver bullet. Why? Because places like Canada, with only 40 million people, produce enough food for 100 and some million people. We in the United States, with 330 million people, produce enough commodity for like four times that. So we do need trade, but trade is not a silver bullet because remember, the other countries like Ukraine, Brazil, Kazakhstan, India, Australia have also learned to make food. Specifically pork. Now we're talking a lot about that because pork, a lot of it goes to China. China's been a problem for us and we say, okay, but that's because Donald Trump put these tariffs on. Is that going to go away? Probably. Is that going to make everything rosy? Well, remember, we worry about rosy and cozy with China, but China's like that, that big spender that you always invite to your poker game and they make the deal and they make the bet and then they Welsh on their bet. Whether we have a trade deal with China or not doesn't mean that they're actually going to stand by the deal because generally they have not. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is probably our best bet to sell more pork and more agricultural commodities because that are those are the other countries in the Pacific region that are going to be uh, good customers for us. You know, the Vietnams and the uh, countries like that over in Asia. That I see happening, and that would be good for us. I see the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is now called the USMCA, getting stronger, which is a good thing for us here in the United States and all of our neighbors, our two big trading partners, Canada and Mexico. Number two, renewable energy. This is going to be a big challenge for us, but also somewhat of an opportunity. Biden has pledged he's going to throw trillions of dollars at green energy. Will it be the Green New Deal that was a bit radical, pushed by folks like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Likely not, because it'll be tempered by a Republican Senate, and it will not get approval if it's too radical. What does it do for ag? Well, first off, it's a ethanol. That's great. Renewable fuel ethanol. Yes. However, remember... Biden is going to throw huge amounts of money at electric vehicles. That's right. Biden is going to put up, according to this Bloomberg article, half a million charging stations throughout the United States of America. 500,000 charging stations might actually make electric vehicles more practical. Right now, electric vehicles are just 2% of the market. But he throw money at this, which he intends to do, with a $7,500, that's right, $7,500 tax credit to those who buy electric vehicles and you put up charging stations, this deal gets better and better. Electric vehicles do not need ethanol. Also, do not forget that California Governor Gavin Newsom put a law in place that all passenger cars in California must be electric starting in the year 2035. So what are we talking about? We're talking about electric vehicles. We're talking about ethanol gets a bump in the short run because it is renewable. But if we're talking about the long haul, ethanol's time to play is probably in the next five to 10 years. I've been saying this for quite some time because remember, the oil companies are not going to go away without a fight. Yeah, Biden's against fracking. Yeah, he's against fossil fuels. He's against coal. But the reality is, we still are going to have those players, those large oil companies that would like to have a place at the table. Where else might it help us in terms of renewable fuel? We're going to see it with such things as windmills. Now, a lot of us in agriculture own rural property. I don't necessarily like the idea of windmills because they kind of are unsightly. But if we're going to throw all this money to say we want even more of it, windmills are not going to be built in downtown Los Angeles. They're going to be built in rural America, which means it's an income opportunity. Granted, it's taxpayer money that's subsidizing the construction of these, but less probably 
when it becomes upscale than it is right now. Meaning we might be the people that have the windmills on our property and take the lease if you choose to do so. Where else do I see this? Uh, I see carbon and climate change policy impacting us greatly. What do I mean? Carbon and climate change policy, for instance, he has stated he's going to reward farmers for planting certain crops that sequester carbon. Now, the reality is all plants sequester carbon, so Joe needs a little refresher, maybe needs to go to uh, VOAG 101, but in the meantime, He's talking about a carrot approach, not a stick approach, meaning not going to punish us or enforce force us to plant certain crops, saying he's going to pay us to plant certain crops. I've been saying for quite some time that uh, cover crops are the way of the future to protect our soil. Now, if we're talking about government policy that says we not only are thinking it's a good idea, we are going to pay you to put out cover crops, that means we're going to reduce tillage, which means we're talking about carbon emissions, yada, yada, etc., etc. I see us now having less tillage, more cover crops, and also probably a bit more government regulation on how we treat our soil. Look at Alberta. Look at Alberta, where there is this regulation and this sort of legislation already in place. You get paid a few bucks an acre if you do things a certain way, and that money comes from uh, a carbon emitter like an energy company. We're going to see something like that. Here is my prediction. What else do I see? Um, I see? I see more lands being taken out of production. Um, under a Biden presidency, if it's all about the climate and it's all about the uh, environment, there's going to be more monies thrown at that. This is what I would call ultimately good for marginal land and marginal land owners out here in the countryside. But again, it's more government and do we really want that? The third category that's going to be impacted by us in the business of agriculture uh, under a Biden presidency is the issue on immigration. Okay, this is a biggie. This is a biggie, and I'll tell you why. 76% of hired farm workers are foreign born. Three quarters of all the hired farm workers out here in these two million farms in the United States of America were born somewhere else, generally in Latin America. Now, this is from the United States Department of Labor, and it was a uh, survey conducted by the National Agricultural Workers Survey. This was done in 2016. Have these numbers changed? Probably a little. Very much? No, they haven't changed very much. Half of hired farm workers, so we've got 76% of them are foreign-born. Half of these hired farm workers are undocumented. Half of these are undocumented. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a reality a reality that we've just got uh, a whole bunch of foreign-born workers. This has been the case for a long time. You know, I talk about this in my book, Food Fear. If you haven't picked this up yet, I'd encourage you to do so. I've got an entire chapter in here. It starts on page 181. Immigration indigestion. Who's working the farms? And I talk about the need for a guest worker program. But under a Biden administration, I see a guest worker program actually happening, but the first thing that's going to happen is probably a path to citizenship. Now, this gets very political. We've got the whole Trump crowd that wanted to build a wall and ship them back, and we've got the reality that this never happened, and I can tell you why it didn't happen, because if you go to Dodge City, Kansas, there are people working in our meat plants that if you ship them back would mean you have no burger. If we shipped them back, that means that that dairy facility that's making sure that the cows get milked so that you have cheese to have with your wine at night with your lovely spouse, you would not have that cheese because you would not have that milk because you would not have that worker. There's a reason why we never shipped them back. They're doing 76% of the work on the farms, and that's not to mention what's going on in the meat processing plants, the egg sorting plants, etc., etc. And I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm talking about the very real, very real situation that is happening out here. Native-born Americans are opting not to do production agriculture work or even second level up the chain level work in agriculture like meat packing, meat processing, egg sorting, etc, etc. So what's going to happen? Under Biden-Harris administration, I absolutely see the first substantive push that will get huge backing, depending on if the politics can make it happen, toward a path to citizenship. And you're saying, is that because they love foreigners? 
Well, let's be real. If you love power, which a person that's been in political office for 47 years as a career politician does, you love having a base that's going to reelect you. If you're the presidential contender, you're the president or vice president, and you're the reason that this thing finally got resolved and your family now is here legally or on a path to citizenship or somehow gets more federal benefits for being here, whatever those things might be, whatever that legislation looks like, you're probably going to reward those that did that for you. So let's not be naive here. If there's 14 million undocumented workers here, as we call them, and we don't know the exact number because, of course, it's under the under the shade, shadow of illegal immigration, if 14 million new Americans or even half that number become Americans, you've got 7 million voters. What did we just see this election numbers looked like? It was 74 million for one side, 70 million for the other. So let's just say you got half of the undocumented workers at 14 million, let's say half that 7 million. That would be 10% of a swing, which would probably go one way versus the other. Again, I'm not getting political. I'm giving you political reality. I see these things happening under a Biden administration. I see trade deals happening because they will want to get some big feathers in their cap and be able to say, we're not Trump. We didn't go around starting trade wars. We didn't put tariffs on. We're going to be back to doing work. And there's going to be unions that maybe or don't like that. There's going to be certain factions that don't like that. But these are the realities. They're going to want to get a feather in their cap within the first year in office. They're going to say and tout the heck out of, we've got a new trade deal and here it is. We're going to see, and that'll be good probably for us. Trade deals usually do work out well for us because we're used as a whipping boy and as a bargaining chip in things like China which, let's face it, they wanted to sell us their manufactured goods, and they knew the only way they could hurt us if we weren't buying their manufactured goods, if we weren't buying their artificial Christmas trees or their cheap manufactured products, they can only hurt us by not buying our ag products. Agriculture usually gets hurt on trade strife, but benefited on trade deals. The factories in my part of the world sometimes are hurt more than the farms because of trade deals. So we will see a trade deal in the first 12 months if the Biden administration takes over because they'll want to be able to tout the heck out of that and run around like a fish on a stringer. We will see renewable energy pushes and environmental regulation. We will see, we hope, it done via carrot versus stick on how our farming practices are. Waters of the United States was a big problem in 2015, and we kept it from happening. We will see uh, a push to spend more money out here on green and clean energy. That will help ethanol in the short term. It does not help ethanol in the long term because, again, Joe would like to have more electric vehicles. Electric vehicles don't burn ethanol. What will we see also? We'll see a push for more wind power. Benefits rural landowners because that's where they build windmills. Uh, also changes the rural scenery. Uh, we will see... We will see probably regulation on how we're allowed to farm, what we're allowed to do to our soil, whether we have to keep it planted, cover cropped, whether we can till it in the fall. Those kinds of things are probably coming, and it will be administered by the USDA. I see it happening. We will see a guest worker program, but probably not until after we call it a path to citizenship for those that are here working illegally but doing their jobs. There will be stipulations on that. And the good thing is all of the workers in agriculture that are here illegally are working very, very hard for our industry. So that is because those folks will then not only have a path to citizenship, it will be a path to future presidential elections is my prediction. I'm Damian Mason. I brought up those three specific categories as I see a Biden presidency impacting the industry of food, fuel, and fiber here in the United States of America and even in Canada and Mexico because, after all, that's part of our first big trade deal, the USMCA. Uh, you can disagree with this. That's fine. You will not hurt my feelings. I have not said anything offensive. I simply am telling you the way I see it. Um, American farmers facing new uncertainty. My heart goes out to you. I would say this. We probably are going to have actually a bit more stability um, on our trade arrangements. We probably at least will then uh, know what our markets look like. And also, we've always had uncertainty in 
farm land out here. We've always had that. So my advice to everybody in the business is it's not going to be any more tumultuous than it has been. And also, uh, you know what? This is nothing new to us. So just realize I've been paying attention since I was a kid and since I went and got my degree in agricultural economics. We've always talked about what's farm policy, what's the farm bill going to look like, which, by the way, comes up again here in just a few years. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you want to drop me a line, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's the Damian Mason channel on YouTube. Also, uh, this is a bonus track of the Business of Agriculture podcast. Um, I, uh, I wanted to make sure I got this out for everybody. I'm going to, um, for sure, have to thank my sponsor, who is Harvest Profit. Haven't mentioned them all today. Harvest Profit is a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. If you run in a farm or an ag enterprise, you need software to keep everything straight. All those millions of dollars of things you've got going on and land and capital here and equipment over there. Go to harvestprofit.com and get a software solution that'll help you be more profitable. Also, a big thank you to my friends at the Georgia Agricultural Commodity Commission for Milk. Uh, remember, milk is an amazing source of protein. You talk about fast and convenient. Why are you stopping at a, con a fast food restaurant? Just pour yourself a glass of milk and run out the door. It's fast, it's convenient, and it's good for you. Nine essential nutrients. Till next time, it's Damian Mason. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it you being here. And again, drop me a line if you have any more thoughts on this very subject. It's continually evolving, as we all know, right? We, we absolutely are probably in, in, a, in a situation that's fluid right now. So who knows? We haven't even really officially declared the winner of this presidential race. Till next time, it's the business of agriculture.